can't buy It resides between my eyes Walk through the fire Came out better on the other side See life's like a peach If you find the same And right now I'm feeling like a hundred grand You are listening to Inspired Insider With your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders, like some of the founders you've heard of, some you've never heard of. You know, Kelly, Kellyanne, I was talking to um, a lady yesterday, uh, Andrea Houston, who went through four life-altering events while running her 25-year-old design and event firm, Artitude's Design. People need to check it out. It's really intense, actually. Um, Andrea is amazing too. So check that episode out. Kim Walsh Phillips from PowerfulProfessionals.com. She grew several seven figure businesses, but at one point had to sell her wedding ring to make ends meet. So if you're an entrepreneur and you've experienced kind of this winding path, you'll totally relate to her story. So check that episode out. Um, before I introduce today's guest, who's a rock star of a person and entrepreneur, Kellyanne uh, Fidio. I'm going to tell you this episode is brought to you by Rise25. You know, I co-founded Rise25 with my business partner, Jen Corcoran. And what we basically do is we help you connect to your best relationships. We help you give your best relationships. Kelly, and you are one of those givers too. So I know that you love this. It's like, how do you profile your best relationships? Your It could be business. It could be partnerships. It could be friends. It doesn't matter on your platform. Podcasting is the best, single-handed, best way I've seen in my doing this for over 10 years. If you want to learn more about podcasting, we will help businesses launch and run their podcast. You can go to rise25.com. I was really inspired by my grandfather. I won't go into the whole story. You can go to my about page on inspiredinsider.com and check out more. But he was a Holocaust survivor and his legacy lives on because of an interview, because the Holocaust Foundation did an interview with him. You can watch the full interview. It's an hour or the shortened version there. It, it makes me have gratitude and appreciation for my life. But I feel like when I have Kelly on, people like you on, I'm not just, you know, we're not just talking about amazing things like you're going to talk about how do you increase your valuation and exits and all of that, but it's about helping my guests leave a legacy beyond, you know, just the business side. So check out rise25.com if you have questions. Without further ado, I do want to give a big shout out, Kelly, to Laurent Hirschkorn, who's a mutual friend, founder of IncrementumDigital.com, because that's the reason we met. Okay. I don't know if you remember that, but we had an event and he's like, oh, can I bring my colleague, um, invite Kellyanne? I'm like, yeah, I totally trust you, Laurent. And Kellyanne came and she is freaking sharp as a, like the sharpest knife you could find. <laughs> like this, this lady is amazing. So, um, Kellyanne Fidio founded and scales her own multi-million dollar e-commerce brand. Then a successful seven figure exit. She now helps brands identify maximize their profit opportunities in their Amazon business and optimize their operations, develop a solid exit strategy, which, uh, you know, I, I think I'm guilty of that. We just, we need to do that from the get-go, not just wait till we're ready to sell. Right, Kelly? So yeah. um, she offers strategic consulting and works directly with brand owners. She's curated a list, which she considers her dream team of experts to help you maximize the value of your business. And there's a lot of mistakes along the journey, which we'll talk about. And so if you want to learn more, go to amazingexits.com. Her and Paul Miller have groundbreaking podcasts. They share their top insights. They have top experts and brands talking about their journey. If you want to work directly or contact Kellyanne directly, you can go to digitalshelfstrategy.com. Kellyanne, I'm going to stop talking. Thank you for joining me. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me, Jeremy. This is so exciting. Glad to finally be doing this with you. You know, what's interesting about your journey, um, when I look through it, is... You're an attorney by trade. Yeah. And um, in a former life. That's that's yeah. And John Corker, my business partner, calls himself a recovering attorney. Yeah. Um, because he doesn't practice anymore. But tell me about the going from attorney to e-commerce seller. Yeah, definitely it wasn't like a straight progression. I don't think back when I was in law school and you know, practicing for almost 10 years that I would have ever imagined I'd be where I am now. Um, but you know, it really comes down to, um, the type of life that I wanted to have, you know, I've told the story many times, but you know, I'm a mom and wife first and foremost. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I was able to work a hundred hours a week, billable hours when I was an attorney, when I was single, you know, back in my heyday, but after getting married and having children, it just wasn't conducive to the life that I wanted to live. I wanted to be, you know, free and, and have time freedom to be able to raise my kids and spend time with them. And, 
you know, not only are the hours and litigating very grueling, but you, it's really hard to leave that work at the office, right? You come home with it. I'm sure John has the same stories. And so um, pretty much a couple years um, after my first daughter was born was when, you know, my husband and I decided, you know, we have to figure out something else. And so we made that big leap for, for me to stay home and, you know, uh, so grateful. That what was the first thing that. you did? So you're like, okay, hundred hours a week, a child, I mean, anyone has, has had a child, um, like you don't sleep. You know, and so doing that with not sleeping, child's not sleeping, what was the first thing you decided to do? To like, okay, I need something else. Oh, it, I just, I wanted out so badly. I, I literally was living on no sleep and I'm, you know, also really avid into working out. So I had to fit my workouts in and I would go on my lunch breaks. I would drive. The daycare was like, you know, with traffic, like 45 minutes away see her for maybe 15 minutes as a baby, you know, as a six week old baby, um, and then go back. And I just had this just huge pit in my stomach day in, day out. And so I told my husband at that time, you know, he was in pharmaceutical sales at that time and he was making good money, but certainly, you know, not enough to replace my income. I just said, I don't care if we have to sell our house, move into an apartment. Yeah. Um, you know, you've uh, had enough at that point. On. I, I will do whatever it takes to stay home with my baby. And, you know, we wanted to have another. So, at that point, it was just kind of like jumping off uh, without a parachute and we were going to figure it, you know, out on the way down. <laughs> what did you try first? Well, I didn't try anything for a while. Actually, my husband is a rock star. I mean, he's super successful in sales. So, you know, he just kept climbing in his position and, you know, really was able to um, take the heat off of me of, of having to work. Of course, we mm. had to put other goals on hold during that time, like investing goals and building our wealth and all that kind of stuff. Um, but when it was time for me to get back into something, I just knew that I had to do something that was, you know, location independent. So I, I pretty quickly narrowed in. I've got to do something online. I don't know what the hell it is, but I have got to do something <laughs> online, right? And so, you know, I went down the rabbit holes of internet marketing, you know, everything you could think of under the sun, internet marketing wise, I tried, I failed. <laughs> Um, what were some and, of the things you tried that didn't work? Oh gosh, work? like affiliate marketing, blogging. Um, you know, I tried, um, you know, just basically anything I could get my hands on that I could make a quick buck. And it, it just all was just an epic fail. It just, I learned a lot. I learned a lot about internet marketing principles, which yeah. is good. But they I would, do a good job marketing internet marketing, say you'll they, make they this, do. you know, in one week. You're like, cool. And then yeah. you're like, wait, maybe it doesn't work that way. Yeah. The whole, the whole make money online niche is like probably one of the biggest internet marketing niches. Right. And so I, you know, I was <laughs> embroiled at that probably for, gosh, a good two years. But I did learn a ton about, you know, what it takes to succeed with internet marketing. Again, I, I was not successful. I didn't make a dime. It wasn't until I, you know, found this model with drop shipping, and specifically it was drop shipping on eBay um, that I started to see some success. In other words, I started making money and I, very quickly went from making zero to 10,000 plus a month. And I was like, holy crap, like this working online thing actually works. Like I found something, but then, you know, that started feeling like it was just a big job. And so it was around that time, like circa 2013, that this little course um, came out called Amazing Selling Machine. Mm -hmm. And it was all about how to, you know, launch and, and scale your own brand on the Amazon platform. Mm -hmm. And I had been, I I've had Matt Clark and his, his co-founder on the podcast before. Yes. And yeah. Jason Katzenbach. And Jason yeah. Katzenbach so yeah. Big, big fans of theirs. I mean, if it wasn't for Amazing Selling Machine, I would not, you know, be here today. And, you know, I joined Amazing Selling Machine through one of their top affiliates, Ryan Moran. So I was in his group. It was called The Tribe. And, yeah. you know, just met some really great people. And that's really where I would say my, my entrepreneurial career really started in terms of knowing, okay, I want to be in this realm of selling physical products to people. I want to sell them online. I want to create my own brand. You know, I had big visions for what that brand was going to look like. And, um, you know, utilizing the amazing selling machine course is kind of like a springboard into doing that was really, really helpful. But then of course there's, you know, that's kind of like your basic education and there's a lot you learn, uh, through experience along the way. So what were some of the things you learned from Ryan Moran? Oh, Cause wow. I know he's pro, you know, he, does a lot of online training, teaching. Um, what did you learn from him? 
He, yeah, he's, he's amazing. Um, I still consider him, I don't talk to him anymore, but I still consider him to be one of, you know, one of my most inspirational mentors. I still listen to his podcast. He's got a great podcast, capitalism.com, but he really focused on building an audience and building a brand and rather than just schlepping products. And he was pretty, you know, staunch about that very early on. And, you know, I have to admit when I first got started, I, I was kind of shopping products because that's kind of how the model is. You find, you know, a hot selling product, at least back in that day and, you know, and make a, your own version of it and sell it. And I was very successful with that. But, you know, very early on, I had that ingrained in me that really to, to create a true business, I need to create a brand. And so that was my focus pretty early on. So what was your first drop shipping product? What were you, what did you do? Do you remember? Yes, I do. It was, um, I, I was really successful with pet products and it was this little wooden, like little staircase for like, little dogs so that they could go up to the couch. <laughs> the do you have that. a dog? Why that? What's that? Do you have a dog? Why did you decide on that? You know what? I just focused in on that niche, like pet products. And I mean, obviously it's a huge industry and that product was just selling like hotcakes on eBay. And so I was able to um, basically, you know, find it elsewhere cheaper and then arbitrage it over on eBay. Mm. So now you will call it graduate to your own building your own brand. Yes. How do you decide where to go? Did you continue on the pet products? No, no, I didn't. Um, and you know, I, I still have these visions of grandeur someday that I'm going to start a pet brand because I do love animals and I love my little Frenchie and mm. I would love to start like a brand just based around French bulldogs, but that's, that's for another day. But, um, yeah, I knew that, you know, I wanted to create a brand that served somebody like me. So I was my own best customer. So I created a women's outdoor lifestyle brand, mm. um, and, you know, really focused on, um, developing products that would cater to, you know, women who love to enjoy the outdoors, um, and products that would help them really help, um, make that experience more enjoyable, more comfortable and more stylish. You know, I know you're very data driven. So what were some things you look at before you decide to launch a new product? Well, on Amazon, you're, the data that you're mostly looking for is you're looking for a keyword volume. So, you know, that, that's got to be the first thing. There's got to be keyword search demand for your product. And, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people like to say on Amazon, you're not selling products, you're selling keywords, basically. So I looked for products that had, you know, mid mid level, you know, keyword demand, not super, super competitive. Um, and then also I was always on the hunt for emerging trends. So, you know, within a niche, you're looking at maybe products that haven't quite hit Amazon yet, but are trending on other sites like maybe Etsy or Pinterest or other social media platforms. Um, are there any uh, recommendations you have for specific tools um, for doing any research that you like? Product research? Yeah, product research, yeah. Yeah, um, product research is, I like to say, both art and science. So there's the, the hard data, there's the keyword search traffic, there's the competition, there's, you know, if you're going to try to get to, let's say, page one for a particular keyword, you've got to look at, you know, who's on page one and if you compete with them from, you know, a review standpoint, a price standpoint, a product quality standpoint. Um, so I like to mix both art and science. You've got to, you know, you've got to have demand there, but... Again, I like to focus on emerging trends and I like to look off of Amazon for product ideas. So I like mm. to look at product catalogs. Um, I like to look at, you know, other social media sites. I like to look at, you know, the magazine at the airport um, or in the, on the airplane. I forget what that thing's called. Sky Mall, I think. Um, yeah. And uh, go into physical retail stores. Can't, you know, really do that much right now or so we're starting to get back to it. But, you know, look for what's out there that's not on Amazon yet, but fits within a niche that you know is, is evergreen, that people are always going to want of our products. Yeah. That's really smart. You know, I like that you, you look for these offline versions because you talk about product catalog, right? And you think, well, these people are spending hard dollars to mail, like these things are heavy into <laughs> homes. So, you know, they, if they could prove it out, they wouldn't keep mailing these catalogs and why not you know, kind of utilize the research that they're doing. Exactly. Into what else and is going? There's so many online catalogs too that you can look. You don't have to just look at the. I mean, every like catalog that I get in the mail, I look at, or I did when I was, you know, really busy and in creating products. And right now, I don't have a, a brand. Right now, I'm helping others with their brands. But when I launch a new brand someday, whenever that is, you know, definitely, I that's one of my biggest resources. And there's a lot of online catalogs as well. So. Kellyanne, um, I want to talk about big winners, big losers, because <laughs> it has been in business like 
listen, we don't get it. Even, you know, Hall of Fame baseball players, they bat 300. Like, you know, they, they get out seven out of 10 times. And so the same goes for, for these type of things. But I don't know. I, I want to talk about one thing before I talk about big winners, big losers. But um, stealing an idea. What's an idea, a product you'd give away? Like you're, you're like, I'm not going to do this. If oh you're listening right now, this is something like, listen, if I were to do it right now, like this minute, here's one thing, one product or category that I would recommend you look at that you are like, I'm not going to execute on. I hope someone else like runs with it. Well, you really put me on the spot, Jeremy. I know. All right. Well, I'm not going to say that I'm never going to do this, but one niche that mm -hmm. I have identified that I think is a really good niche. I'm not going to give any specific product ideas, but a niche is women's office decor. Hmm. Okay. And I think that um, there is a lot of potential in that niche. Okay. Especially right now when people are working from home. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've had this idea for, I mean, I have like a spreadsheet of just ideas. and. I'll tell you, stuff. you know, Kelly, what I bought, I mean, I bought um, this monitor razor that looks cool. That is just like a glass thing. It took me like five seconds to put together. And my wife's like, oh, that's really cool looking, you know, to your point. She's like, will you order me one? And so it's just, <laughs> my monitor is sitting on this thing. It probably, it cost me $23. I don't know how much it costs to make, but it looks nice. So to your point, I've even bought, you know, my wife liked it. So I guess it's women's office decor. It would be considered cool. that. Maybe right? they need to make a, you know, so, make it in a different color for women. So there's right? an idea for someone. Uh, it's yeah. called Hamudu. H-E-M-U-D. I don't even know what it is. You said it was called a razor. What is it called? No, it, it's like I was looking for something to raise the monitor. Oh, so like, raise, so okay. like I can, yeah, but it's not, it's not like electric. It's just like yeah. just a stand that I yeah. put my monitor on. And so people could check it out on Amazon. H-E-M-U-D-U. -U. It was like $23. It looks pretty. So, you know, there you go. I bet you, what is it? A piece of plastic? It's No, it's, it's glass. It's like tempered oh, right. glass clear glass so it goes with anything and that's probably why she liked it with just like a little stand on it yeah. you know but now somebody could go out and develop one in kind of like an ombre glass color yeah for women, and then specifically target you know office decor for women yeah and also i it's not brand specific like i wasn't searching for a specifically exactly. yeah. specific brand right and so you know it's like whatever it, it could be easily um that's the quintessential private label product right yeah there. So yeah. it looks kind of like this, like this little glass thing, but that's not it, you know? Um, but, uh, so yeah, so thank you. That that's great. I've already bought and stuff, you know, related to that. So I'll, I'll second that one. So wow. big winners, big losers. What's one that you thought, um, you're like, I have the next hot product. This is going to be my best seller. And it bombed. Um, do I have to say if you have to admit it? No, you could whatever, whatever you want to share. I mean, no one's going to want to replicate it because it, <laughs> well, or, I'll share a story for another brand that I had with a partner, actually, my good okay. friend Iran. So this is yeah. a brand we're no longer running, but we, we, we did have a really great idea and all the research backed it up. Um, you know, we did everything on point, the marketing, but it just goes to show you that sometimes, you know, you're going to have winners and losers. And, you know, I, I like to have, you know, kind of a, average ratio or the kind of numbers that I have are, you know, out of every 10 products that I plan to launch, you know, hopefully have seven winners. And so this particular product that we put a lot of time and resources into, you know, just didn't, just didn't hit the mark. And again, I don't want to name, name. Why the do you product. think it, why do you think it, it didn't, like you said, you're like everything checked out from like the keyword research and, and whatever competition or whatever you're looking at what what do you think it was you know and actually, you both you and Laurent are very experienced at this so yeah yeah so it's you know hopefully he doesn't mind me sharing this this failure <laughs> um but um you know what i think it is is we added a lot of components to this product and and which raised the cost because it was a premium offering right mm -hmm. and i generally like to have premium price points premium products um, but I think what we ended up doing was, you know, this is all, you know, learned in hindsight, but I think we just priced ourselves out of the market by doing mm. that. So you think it was, it would have been competitive, just the price isn't, it, it just goes to show if one of those aspects is off, mm -hmm. it's not going to sell. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? By then it was too, too late because we put all this, this time and resources and design work into this particular, 
you know, bundle, if you will. And it had too many components. And in order to be profitable, we had to charge a certain price. And so, you know, de definitely took away so many great lessons from that and had a lot of fun too. Um, talk about a winner. You don't have to talk about a specific product, but um, winners and sort of like you saw like these two or three metrics were like on point and that led you to make the decision to actually do, you know, not saying again, like you just mentioned everything on point and the price was off. One thing was not on and that didn't work out. What was one where it worked out just as you expected it to? What were the key metrics you, you saw that were in your favor? Well, I would say that the, the first product that I launched in my brand was, was a home run. And the only caveat to that is I didn't plan on it being a home run. I planned on it being a base hit and it turned it turned out to be a home run. So I was lucky in that that way. Um, but the metrics at the time, which I still feel like hold true today, because back back when I got started, you know, the methodology was really to find something that had, you know, it was very high keyword demand. And this particular product, um, back then, nobody was teaching, and they still don't really teach to look for emerging trends. And this was an emerging trend. And I just felt really strongly, even back in 2014, that you know this is, I just have a good instinctual feel that this particular niche is gonna take off. And so it had, it had solid keyword demand, um, it, you know, I knew I would be able to compete, but again, the, the sales metrics on it, I thought were going to be a base hit and it turned out to be a home run because as I predicted, the niche did explode. And so that goes back to my earlier comment that, you know, a lot of everything we do in selling on Amazon or being e-commerce or brand owners is art and science. You know, you've got to look at the data, you've got to make data driven decisions, but there's so much art to it and subjectivity to it. Talk about, so let's get to valuation. You decide, okay, um, I'm going to sell my business. <laughs> Is there a certain time frame sh people should be looking at doing that? Do you, looking back, do you wish you would have sold, waited? Do you wish you would have done it sooner? No, I, I actually, I put a lot of planning into my exit and that's where I'm really passionate about being able to reach sellers now on their journey because you know, I've shared this on other podcast interviews. You you shouldn't just wake up one day and decide, oh, I'm going to sell my business and now let me go out and do that. You should you should always be running any type of a business with the end in mind, with an exit strategy, and you should always know the value of the asset that you're building, regardless of whether or not you're going to sell it. And so, you know, I would say that you you need to you know put exit planning into your your workflow into your into your life as far as being a business owner exit planning should always be a part of that i feel very strongly about that because if you ever do decide to sell then you're going to know exactly how much that business is worth and you're going to be prepared and you can also be you know if an opportunity comes along if, if somebody comes along or a company comes along or a private equity firm comes along and wants to acquire you and they offer you a certain amount you know you know what the value of that asset that you've built and you know, on the other side of that, you could have an emergency where you, you need to get out and you don't want to have to have a fire sale of your business. You need to know like what it's worth and what you'd be able to command for it in the market. So I feel very strongly about exit planning. Um, if I were going to start a, a new business today, I would be doing it with the end in mind. Um, so when I started planning for my exit, it was well in advance of when I actually exited. It was about two years, but I would recommend at the very least, you know, 12, 12 months minimum of starting to plan before actually selling. Um, Kelly, and with that, what are some, and, and by the way, the same, obviously the same things you use to, you know, sell are the same things you do to actually put systems in place and actually make your business increase in valuation, I imagine. What are some things where people are like, okay, I want to start planning today. What are some things you recommend they start to look at or start to do? Well, the very first thing um, I would say, and, and hopefully this is something that's already in place, but it, it, it's just very, very crucial is really good bookkeeping. So having good bookkeeping, um, especially e-commerce bookkeeping, which is accrual based and a good CPA. Um, and making sure that you have clean books, clean financials, you're able to at all times, you know, know, you know, what your profit and losses are, know what your balance sheet states and also cash flow uh, management. And so, 
you know, one thing that I had wish I had done um, early on is to work with a, you know, a fractional CFO. Um, and there are services and providers that do that to really help you manage your cash flow because that's one of the things that I think a lot of e-commerce uh, brand owners get into trouble with is cash flow management. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, you know, at the core of everything. You've got to have clean books to be able to make any, you know, intelligent decisions, not only about how to operate your business on a day to day basis, but when it comes comes time to sell. Um, you know, beyond that, um, you know, there's going to be a team of advisors that you're going to need uh, to surround yourself with as you do your exit planning. You're going to need, you know, not only somebody, uh, an intermediary to help you sell your business, whether that is a, a broker or a mergers and acquisitions advisor, but you're also going to need a good attorney, um, preferably an a mergers and acquisitions attorney that, you know, knows this, this field of law and also a good um, tax strategist, whether that's your CPA or it could be somebody else um, that helps you plan for the tax consequences of your sale. For the fractional CFO, um, is that someone who's also your accountant or a totally separate role? It can be, but usually it's usually it's different. Um, and so, you know, it, it just depends on what role you are. You know, there's there's varying degrees of specialties offered by CPAs out there. You know, some just do tax preparation. Right. Um, some do strategic planning. Um, you know, some do cash flow management. Some even do bookkeeping, although they sh any good account should not be doing bookkeeping because that's just a waste of their time. Um, so, you know, the, the, a good CPA should be a good strategist and, and could be able to help you, but oftentimes, you know, it's, it's more of an internal role, or you can have what's called like a fractional CFO, somebody who is not solely working for you, but they do CFO services for lots of different businesses and they can help you with that too, because, you know, it's, it's so easy to get in, in trouble being a e-commerce brand owner, especially selling on Amazon, where at the click of a button, you can accept an Amazon loan, you know, for hundreds of thousands of dollars deposited into your bank account. Um, and I'm going to go on vacation. No, I'm just <laughs> yeah. you don't have a good strategy on how to deploy that money and, and knowing how, you know, your cash flow is working. Um, and, that, and that's with any, you know, any, any business, any investment, you know, you need to understand how that's working. And I think that gets overlooked by a lot of Amazon sellers, unfortunately. Kellyanne, at what point do you say you should get a uh, fractional CFO? Like at what maybe dollar amount in someone's business or, you know, like if they're just starting, should they start off with that? No, or, no, I don't so think. What, what point is like, okay, it makes sense to get one now? I think that if you are planning an exit within the next, you know, 12 months, um, you definitely should look into it. At least have somebody come and, and, and look at your you know strategy. You've got to know like where you're at in the cycle of your business. If you're planning on exiting, you know you're not necessarily focused on you know top line growth. You might be just focused on profitability, um, you know, before your exit. So you know that's where a cash flow you know strategy really comes into play and, and knowing you know um, how you're going to position your company um, for sale. And what the value of that's going to be, if you're deploying all of your cash for new product development and advertising, you know, you're going to have that's a growth mode. So you're not going to be showing a really strong bottom line there. So it depends on the stage. But I would say, you know, definitely once you reach, you know, the seven figure mark, I think would be a good time to look into that. Um, but I believe that every seller from the beginning should have good bookkeeping in place. Yeah. I mean, to your point, you know, whether you're going to sell or not, having some someone like that look and if you want to grow well how much can you afford to grow and how much exactly. can you invest in growing is also important too from knowing your numbers and oftentimes sometimes is running a business our strength isn't knowing the exact number some people it is mine is not necessarily more like big picture okay let's get this going um and need someone else looking at the fine details what are yeah. some other things? So you mentioned a couple, your dream team, right? So it'd be a fractional CFO, mergers, and acquisitions, it could be a lawyer, it could be a broker, uh, attorney, tax registers, any others that you consider uh, people should have a part of their dream team? Um, well, obviously a bookkeeper along with that. And then mm -hmm. when you said the for the for the intermediary, depending on the level of your business, you would have either, you know, an MA advisor, like I said, or a broker. And then on top of that, you know, there's lots of experts that you're going to need along the way to help optimize your 
Amazon business. So, mm. you know, Paul and I, um, you know, when we launch our podcast and, you know, our, our mission really is going to be to connect people with, you know, the, the best curated resources for everything you would need along your journey of exit planning and optimizing your business along the way. So for example, uh, Amazon PPC optimization, you know, we'd be referring you to our good friend, Leron Hirschborn and Incrementum to do your Amazon advertising management. Um, you know, there's a whole plethora of services within just selling on Amazon that uh, a lot of sellers are familiar with, wh whether it comes to, you know, software tools and um, all the way up to brand management. And, you know, that's going to be something that um, I think is going to be a hugely valuable resource that sellers can rely on, you know, hopefully um, trust in Paul and I, our recommendation, because we've either worked with these service providers or we know people who have worked yeah. with them successful results yeah that's a good point so there's business and business related just general and there's amazon specific related professionals whether it's optimization it could be uh, amazon ppc it could be sales tax like an amazon sales tax person it could be an am someone who's who knows like uh, a lawyer that does trademark and and uh, exactly and things it encompasses, like that. It encompasses all those types of experts and professionals yeah. So if you go to Laron and you go, I need your help, make sure you tell them that Kellyanne sent you. <laughs> That's okay. right, Laron. Uh, <laughs> um, what are some things that when you go in and, because people can come to you, Kelly, and go, listen, I am I need just an overall, you know, uh, coach and mentor in this process, right? And, and all of us need coaches. Even look at anyone who's watched the um uh, the last dance for the Bulls, you know, Michael Jordan had Phil Jackson, but he also had a specific strength training coach for each individual aspect, right? So people can come to you and go, hey, I need you to kind of walk me through this. And you also kind of want a non-biased person because if you go to a M&A person or a broker, they're gonna be like, we're the best, you know? And you kind of need someone who maybe doesn't Okay, listen, here's your individual situation. I know they're good at this and they're good at that. What are some things you, you would say to someone right off the bat, Kalyan, that say, listen, start here to increase your valuation. Where should people start? Because everyone's like, yeah, maybe I'm an exit, maybe I'm not, but I definitely want to increase my valuation because that just means my business is improving. What should people start doing in, in that realm? Well, the first thing goes back to, again, the numbers and having clean financials. And the first thing that I would do with, you know, a, a, a client is to look at their look at their financials and look for opportunities to not only reduce costs, but also, you know, like on a product by product basis, looking at, you know, where are they getting the highest profit margin and ROI and doubling and tripling down on that and then cutting out the losers. It's it's coming in as an impartial person. You know, I'm not the one that gathered the data, so I'm not the bookkeeper, but the bookkeeper is not the one analyzing the information. So coming in and helping the business owner analyze the information that they have. And so that presupposes they have good financials. So if I come in and I'm working with somebody and they have, you know, um, messy financials, and the first thing I'm going to do is get them with a good bookkeeper um, and possibly accountants and get that cleaned up. And then we can make decisions because it, it all comes down to the numbers, really, um, on how to run your business. Yeah. Unfortunately, yes. I'm just, I'm just I've gotten really good. At looking at Kellyanne, come on, tell me something easier. No, I'm just kidding. It's, it's um, not kind of sexy for a lot of people. You know that my my mission, my and Paul's mission, is to make this topic sexy. Like, who wants to talk about exit planning? Like, oh my god, that sounds so boring. That sounds like a lot yeah. of work. It's actually a lot of fun because it's like this. It's like this puzzle that you're putting together along the way and the, the end goal is so that you can get the most friggin' money out of right. selling your business when it when it does come time maybe you don't ever right. maybe it's gushing out so much cash and you've got it on auto autopilot you've got it completely systematized that you don't ever want to sell it that's fine but you need to know what that asset is worth because it's probably the biggest asset that you have at least for most sellers i know it is so let's talk about paul paul miller amazing yes. guy stand-up guy um you know you're walking, you guys are walking together on this journey with him. You want to talk about that for a second? I'm going to pull his website up here. Yeah. If you don't own one of these and you have a child, buy one today, cozyphones.com. They're wireless kids, cozy phones. Yeah. How cool is that? So he's partnered with Paw Patrol, Sesame Street. He's done some amazing things. So what are some of the things you guys are walking through together in this process? He has. I mean, I... 
I am so, I'm still so amazed at all that Paul has accomplished with his brand. I mean, he created this category, Jeremy. He created this category of, you know, headband headphones for kids. And of course now, you know, he's being Just knocked off left and right. And, you know, all the competitors have come in, but, you know, he's got, you know, a lot of things up his sleeve to try to combat this from a patent perspective. But, you know, Paul is, um, you know, his company saw, you know, huge growth very early on. And Paul is actually planning on an exit within the next two to three years. And so I'm going to be helping Paul along that journey. And we're going to be very um, candid about that journey in episodes on our podcast and sharing different things that we're working on to optimize Paul's business, Cozy Phones, um, in preparation for an exit in two to three years. Yeah. So if you want the behind the scenes look, you'll have to check out AmazingExits.com and the Amazing Exits podcast to hear them walk you through the journey. Yes. Um, so Jillian, I always ask since Inspired Insider, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, this has been amazing. I always love to hear your expertise. And so people can check out amazingexits.com. They can check out digitalshelfstrategy.com. And if they want to buy a cozy phone, uh, <laughs> you know, they can go to cozyphones.com. Um, what's been, you know, like you said, it's a windy road, this whole journey you know, from attorney um, to e-commerce, entrepreneur to selling to now basically advising other people on selling. What's been a low point in the journey and how you push through? And then what's been a proud moment for you on the journey? You know, a low point is something that I real I felt along the way and now it's hit me really hard too. Um, but then I'm going to talk about now how I've turned that around. But yeah. Um, is when you are on what I like to call this hamster wheel of being a business owner. And let's just talk about Amazon and e-commerce right now. Like it's, it's a glorious business model. I love it. Um, you know, is it as easy as it used to be? No. Is it getting more competitive? Yes. Um, you know, it's still a great opportunity, um, but you have to run it like a real business. And, you know, you can get, you can get caught in this trap of just working, working, working. And like I said, it's true for any business, but, um, when you do that, you're not leaving a lot of time for really preparing for the future. And, you know, in my case, it was wealth planning, um, something that I kind of put to the side and kind of put on autopilot for a while um, in terms of how do we manage, you know, taking profits from the business as I was running it and investing that properly. Um, I kind of did the lazy man's approach of just, you know, investing into, you know, uh, qualified retirement plans and things like that. And ever since I sold the business and, and, and prior to that, I've had a lot of time and have become very educated and, and I feel now at a very advanced level when it comes to, okay, I know how to invest my money now for a really good return. And specifically for me, that's the real estate. And I wish along the way I had paid more attention to that because now at this point I could have grown my wealth. And when I say mine, I mean mine and my family's, um, you know, uh, much bigger um, and, you know, our whole goal, my husband and I is to be financially free in terms of not having to work. We're always going to work because we love what we do. He's, he loves his, his career and, you know, I love business, but you, you want to be able to have that flexibility and say, okay, if I just wanted to live off of, you know, the cash flow of my passive investments, I have that option if I decided to just go take off for a couple of years. And that's, that's the point we're at now. And my exit allowed me to, take chips off the table and have a really good, you know, sum of money to now deploy into creating this, this wealth. But I wish I had been doing that along the way. And so I would really, you know, tell business owners to be, you know, thinking about, um, you know, their business as, you know, what are they getting out of it? You know, if they're reinvesting everything back in, which a lot of owners do, you know, is, is it really worth that? Or are you just waiting for your big payday someday when you sell the business, but take, take at least some chunk of profit and put that away. And I, I, I was, I would really just advise putting that into something that's creating passive cash flow. What about, uh, thank you for that. Yeah. Oftentimes when you're in the mix, it's harder to do that. You feel like you're always kind of spinning your wheels or always reinvesting. And, yeah. um, when you look back, you're like, Oh, I wish I would have just, I forgot someone, it, it, how the saying goes, Kellyanne, it's like, Hey, if I give you a penny every day for a month and I double it or something like that, or I'll give you yeah. ten thousand dollars, and that 
that penny turns into exponential dollars when you just start doubling it. So it's just yeah. kind of that realm. What's been a proud moment in the journey for you when you look back? I, I'm very proud of having created something from nothing with a very minimal investment. I think I, I started my e-commerce brand with about $2,500 loaned to me by my husband, as he likes to point out, um, and turned <laughs> that into a multi-million dollar brand and you know sell for seven figures. That definitely is my my proudest. It's amazing. In my entrepreneurial career. Kellyanne, I want to be the first one to thank you. Everyone check out amazingexits.com, digitalshelfstrategy.com, anywhere else we should point people towards online or are those the best places? No, that's great. Um, Amazing Exits, we are launching our podcast this summer, so stay tuned. Um, we haven't officially launched, but I would love it if people would go to the website and at least enter their email so they can get on our list so we can keep them informed of what's going on. Paul and I are so excited to, to get started with that. And we're doing it with with Jeremy and John's help from Rise 25. I highly recommend anybody that's looking to start a podcast, you definitely need to reach out to Jeremy and John. Thank you for all your help that you've been doing and helping us get that launched. And it's been such a pleasure being here, Jeremy. I really appreciate you having me on. Everyone check it out. I'll take the shout out. By the time you listen to this, it may it's probably already live and they have a bunch of amazing episodes. So <laughs> check it out, amazingexus.com. I don't know how you got the domain. It's a great domain. Kellyanne, always a pleasure. Thank you, Jeremy. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a peach if you find the same. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.